I would like to introduce our chairman, Lindsay Montgomery, um, who we're delighted to have here today. And I'm just going to pop up your slide, Lindsay, or not. Okay, Lindsay. Okay. Thanks, Paula. Good morning and welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many people here today. My name is Lindsay Montgomery and I'm the chair of OSCAR. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce my fellow board members. I'll start with Stuart Cross and Paul is managing to make sure he's on the screen. Stuart is the chair of our audit and risk committee. Then we have Stephanie Fraser, who's a member of our casework committee. Jill Vickerman, who's the chair of our casework committee. Jess Wade, who's also a member of our audit and risk committee. And Shona Ulrichson, who's a member of our audit and risk committee. The only member missing today is our Deputy Chair, Pat Armstrong, who couldn't be with us, unfortunately. Um, I don't know what the final numbers are, uh, Paula, but we had well over 200 people registered to, to, to join us this morning, which does make it our largest ever Oscar event and our first remote Meet the Regulator event. The impacts of the pandemic are widespread across society, as we all know. And this brings into greater focus the huge importance of charities across Scotland. It's clear from a recent COVID-19 impact survey that the pandemic has affected charities in different ways, depending on their size, their area of activity and their funding model. Some have seen huge increases in the demand for their services, while others have been able to do, to, to what they were set up to do. We received around 5,000 survey responses, which was over 20% of those surveyed, which is a terrific return. So many thanks to all those who did that. And we're pleased to be able to share the results of the survey with you today. I hope you find this morning's event interesting and of value. Now I'd like to introduce our Chief Executive, Maureen Mallon. Maureen will give you an overview of what we've been up to over the last wee while, especially in relation to supporting charities during the pandemic and picking up on some of the governing issues which have arisen over the period. I'll see you at the end of the session this morning. Enjoy. Maureen, thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. And I would echo what Lindsay say. It's so fabulous to see everybody. I've been flicking through the screens and thinking, oh, I recognize that person. Oh, who's that? Oh, I recognize that name. So uh, it's, it's a very, very huge privilege for us to get to connect with so many of you. So thank you for attending. And just now the numbers are sitting at 153, it tells me at the bottom of the screen, Lindsay. So um, that, 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 that's, that's pretty good. What I want to do is a, a, a balance across this. We always know that when we come to these kind of sessions, um, people, some, well, you all know who, who, who we are as the Scottish Charity Regulator, otherwise you wouldn't have attended, probably. Um, but we want to make sure that we're giving you some of the basics about, about who we are, not going over old ground. Paula and I thought about it long and hard, bless you, Paula. Um, and uh, you know, really tried to make sure that we're giving you an updated set of information that we, that, that, that we hope will, will, will be of interest interest and use to you. Um, what I want to do before I start on the, the, the slides is to also let you know that not only have we got a great, a, 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 a great richness in having almost all of our board members here today, we've also got quite a lot of our staff here today um, who wanted to come along and say hello and see, see, see folks here too. So what I'm going to ask um, is, is, is if the staff can come off mute and, um, and, and do a bit of a wave and say hello. So if we can, uh, if, if we can find our mute buttons. I'll know it's worked when I can see Paula and Mary coming off mute. Hi. Hello. Morning. Hi. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. All right. Great. Thank you. And you're going to get a chance to see and, and talk to staff later on. We'll join you in, 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 the, in the breakout rooms um, when we go through those sessions. But I think it's just quite important that you know we find it so helpful to come and, and, and meet and engage. It helps us to do our job better. So that's why so many staff are keen to come along this morning. So if we can move on. 
um, what I'll do is I'll take you through I'll, I'll take you through what I'm going to cover. So, a little bit very briefly about us because I'm going with the working assumption that you that, that you all know who we are roughly. Um, what our priorities are for 2021, and as Lindsay was highlighting, um, we I'll do a particular focus in on the ones that we're doing in relation to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about our future priorities and what we've got on the horizon, what our big ticket items are, a little bit more about reporting, and then we'll go into some of the questions. So easy as that, um, and we'll just start making our way through. Oh, Claire says there's feedback coming off. Um, is what I'll do, thanks Claire, is I'm going to do that old fashioned thing of putting my microphone off and starting again. That seems to clear it up most of the time, but hopefully that's doing it this time. Thank you. Yay. Um, so who are we? Um, the regulator for Scotland's 25,000 charities. Um, really um, amazing to see the, the, the scale and diversity that's in there. And this is our vision. Um, it's for a trusted and respected Scottish charity sector, which positively contributes to society. We're an enabling regulator, and you'll hear me talk about that quite often. Um, and we've had discussions um, at previous events where people are saying, how can you be both about improvement and about regulation? For me, that's a very straightforward balance. You, 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 get, uh, you, you, you get a more effective um, regulatory regime if you also follow a very, a, a very clear and transparent improvement agenda. It's, our, it's part of our role um, with, with, within the legislation to make sure that we are making sure that, that there, is an, a, that there is a better um, and, 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 and more focused charity sector. Let's move on. So, statement of the obvious here about Scottish, the Scottish charity sector, it's ridiculously diverse. I think any of us who think we, that we know what the Scottish charity sector landscape is, you're always surprised when you actually see occasional names come up. You think, I just hadn't realised that they're a charity. Uh, so, you know, we've got very, very small groups. The vast majority of groups um, are very small indeed, um, right through to those who um, people would never think for a minute are charities, the so universities and colleges, um, a, 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 lo a lot of the um, NHS Health Trust, the endowment foundations and so on there, and all the church and religious organisations. So if I look out of my own window, I know I look out to um, Historic Environment Scotland and a very, very small field next door um, that happens to be owned by the Lady Park Trust. So I look at the sublime to the ridiculous from my, from, from my own windows here and realise that we've always got to think about that diversity. When people look to Oscar to do certain things, um, we've also got to remember that we're not only here for the well-known names, we're not here for just the big voices. So it's not the, it's not the 10 or 20 well-known hitters in, 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 in the country that we're only here for. We are also here for them and with them and to regulate them. But we've got to think about that complexity of the sector and I think that's an important context of who we are. I think it goes referring back and, and Jude is going to talk a great deal more about the, the surveys because we're so delighted to have the data there. We're so reassured to know that what we've got from that is accurately a really good mi microcosm of this diversity that you see here. So let's move on. So I mentioned being an enabling regulator. And what I want to do is to, is to talk to you about the, the, the four main outcomes that we are using as the focus of our work for the next, the, the next three years. And we'll be publishing our new three-year corporate plan um, fairly shortly. It takes a little bit of time, as many of you will know just now, to get things um, published um, in a way. And although we're going for online publication, we still want it to, 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 to look as best it can and as clear as it can. So it'll be out as soon as possible. So here we are, um, we want to make sure that the public have confidence in charities. That's ultimately what we need to do. If the, if the public have confidence in charities, it's because they know that there's a, there's a regulator there. A lot of the time we know that there's an exact correlation between people knowing that a sector is regulated and actually being able to have confidence, as well, of course, as people having confidence because of the relationships they have with many charities. So the stronger the relationship with, with, with all of your organisations and many more, the stronger the, 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 the feel they have of things being well, well led, of money being well spent, 
of 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 influence being be, be, being had of services being strong the higher the confidence so the more we can do as a regulator to make sure that um if there are difficulties we follow them up cleanly clearly appropriately that we publish um with the, the the findings of any of our inquiries and that we really help people to understand what's happening um, in terms of the charity sector we're really in a, in a in a place over the next in the next few years where we want to make sure that we want to be increasingly visible um, because what we do understand is that um, we've got a discrete role but we've got a very very important function for the for for the public to really truly understand that they can have that confidence so that's something we're really focusing in on we need to make sure that we're a highly effective organisation. That goes without saying, doesn't it? If we're, if we're being paid to be your regulator, we need to make sure that we're the smartest possible regulator. So we're spending a lot of time over the next the next while really focusing in on um, a better digital presence, um, a better digital infrastructure internally. And we're going through an organisation redesign where we're actually looking at um, making sure that, that the roles that we all undertake actually really fit to the priorities that we now have. We're a, we're a 15 year old organisation um, and that's still quite young, um, but it is an organisation that can move into a different space. And really what I would say to you is we're moving very fully into the, the, the enabling space while also still to undertaking quite clearly our regulatory functions. We need to make sure that charities are at the heart of a vibrant and sustainable Scotland. Um, so how do we do that? An awful lot of that is about the sphere of influence we have with government, with local government, with um, all sorts of organisations, funders and so on, to make sure that people fully understand the impact that charities have. Um, for, 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 for many people, I think some of the frustration is that charities can be very misunderstood. Part of the complexity of the, of the, of the sector, for sure. But a lot of that is really down to a, a limited understanding. People will base their understanding of charities and think they know about charities because they know about three or four charities. Therefore, they assume that they understand the charity sector. It's part of Oscar's role to make sure that we're working closely with policy colleagues, with ministers, with parliament, with, with local government, to make sure that they really do understand the impact of their work and, on, on policies before they write them. What we want to do is make sure that we're getting to things ahead of the game and not just coming in complaining at the, at, at, at the end. Our job is to be at the forefront and use the data and intelligence that we have to really make sure that charities are very recognised as, as, as part of the heart of Scotland. I think what's reassuring around that is that it, when you look at the, the country's national performance framework, everything that's now discussed there is discussed with, with an understanding, a clear understanding that um, charities are at the heart of that and a wider third sector of course but um, charities are certainly seen as being a strong, a strong part of, 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 of what, what's, what's required to make a more aspirational Scotland happen. Just as important in there is uh, that charities are well run and thriving you use these words and, and um, people can think, well, what, 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 is it, what, what is our role in doing that? Well, actually, we have a strong uh, role in the improvement agenda. Part of what we need to look at is how can we actually enable charities to be stronger, to, to have higher levels of quality assurance, to be able to give confidence out to the public as well as us actually do, do, doing some of that too. So um, we work closely with a number of other organisations to make sure that, that, um, that, that, that um, the idea of being well run and thriving is at the core of an awful lot of, of, of training and awareness and activity. If we can move on. So here are um, the, the, the priorities that we have for, the, for this year in, our, in this year's business plan, which is published online, which are COVID related. I don't want to go over all of them, but what I did want to do is just highlight that what we've done with our business plan this year is to split it in two. And, and the next slide will actually show you the breadth of what, what is pretty much in effect our business as usual priorities for, for 2021. But we, we know the huge impact that, that COVID is having on the sector. It's having it on, 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 on society as a whole and on, on all of us individually and our, and our family and friends and wider circles. But we wanted to look and think, what are the specific things that we need to do to make a difference to the, to, 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 to the sector and on behalf of the sector during this period? So if you, if you look at just a couple of them there, um, we can speak about one that's very specific to where we are just now, develop interactive online events to complement our communication and guidance. 
we moved into that very quickly and I would want to um, make Paula blush and say that the first thing that, 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 we, that, we, that Paula did was jump in and get some super high quality training so that she was ahead of the game and how to understand the complexities of Zoom so that we could move into high quality space and so far in the sessions that we've had people have been very reassured by the way that we're able to handle these, uh, the, these types of sessions and the quality of interaction that we can still have. We don't want to just sit and talk blankly at 120 people or 150 people. We want to be able to have that interaction and, and that engagement because from this, we'll take an understanding of this. We'll understand things different and this will help to influence and shape the work that we do. So we don't only do it for you, we do it with you and we do it selfishly so that we can do our jobs better. And that's just one priority that I think is worth highlighting. Can we move on to the next slide, Paula? So this is, they're getting little, aren't they? This one's quite wee now, apologies, but as, as, as you know, the slides will be shared um, once, once we're finished. But again, here we are with a lot of ambitious priorities that we've thought through very seriously. You know, we, I've spoken to quite a number of organisations who are saying, oh, well, all bets are off to some of the things that we thought we were going to do this year. We're not able to do this year because of the, of the pandemic. I think we've been tailored, but we're also being ambitious. So one of the main things that I want to highlight here is this building the influence and impact on policy, which is um, it's the second bullet down on the, on the left-hand side. So it, it, go, it goes back to what I was talking about, about being ahead of the game in terms of that influence. We are going to spend a lot more of our time making sure that, if, that we can take everything that we know and understand about charities and influence the shape of policy legislation and guidance, not only with government, but in, in many other spheres. Um, so um, in order to do that, we need to actually look at our own priorities and how we all operate. Um, and that's all a core part of our, our, our redesign as well. So in looking at our priorities this year, we've tried to be tailored, a little bit sensible, but still have a fair old amount of ambition in there. And it's certainly not quite quiet time in Oscar. I do want to pay tribute to, um, to, 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 to our staff. And I, I, I hate to show off about these things, but the, um, the numbers in terms of, 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 of attendance, the numbers in terms of people still engaging are, are absolutely incredible. We've got very high levels of staff who've got um, school-aged children or white, other caring responsibilities and people are still working above and beyond. It's a very dedicated bunch of people that we have in, in, in Oscar. I don't, I don't take that lightly or casually. Um, it's, a, it's a very exciting thing to walk into a group of people who are very ambitious, uh, very ambitious for Scotland's charities. Um, and so what we're trying to do with this is a healthy balance. If we move on again, Paula. So some of the big things that we've got coming up. I've talked about helping the public understand the work of charities. We're doing a lot more in terms of what we're doing in our work with media. We're trying to make sure that we are enabling the public to understand how to use the register to really understand what's going on with Scotland's charities. So quite a lot of, of, of fairly complex work going on in the, in, in the background there. Um, we've been asked quite a number of times over the last few weeks um, for additional information from, uh, from, from BBC, ST, TV and other media to, to really help them understand what is going on with charities and um, before they go out and just talk about it um, and we think that that public understanding is absolutely business critical to for all of us. I talked about raising the profile of, of Oscar and we're going to do that um, as, as, as we go not only over this year but the next three. We want to do more external engagement and I think we've done a fair amount already but what we want to do is to really think through the excitement of being able to do things like this, frankly. Um, although um, we, we, all, we all really get a tremendous amount out of being able to, to, to come out locally and see people through the Meet the Charity event, regulated events. There's something amazing about the reach that we've got today when you think that nobody had to, to get on trains, planes, ferries and automobiles to get together today. We all just had to sit down in our house and click a button. We want to understand how we can maximise a great deal more on the engagements that we do, not only um, of, of our own, but actually joining in with many other organisations. So we, we, we turn up um, for, for an awful lot of slots um, where people want to hear from the regulator. 
one of the other things that's, that's, that's hidden in here um, is the development of a charity reference group. There'll be more coming out on that in due course, but essentially what we're trying to do is build a, a, a group of about, it'll be around 50 strong, between 40 and 50 people um, who will be able to operate as a sounding board for, 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 for us to really understand what's going on in Scotland's charities and to help to shape and influence the work we do and to enable others to do that as well. So that's something that we're working over on over the next month or two. This idea of building stronger relationships um, to, 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 to influence developments, um, it, it's very frustrating for us. If things come to us but as a consultation, then it's too late. And I suppose that for me, it's as simple as that. Um, we've got to be ahead of the game. And an awful lot of that is about people understanding who we are and what we've got to offer. I don't, want that. I don't take it lightly to, to just think people should come to us because they should. Um, we want to make sure that people understand the high level of value they get by engaging with Oscar. And in this last slide here, um, or this last bu bullet point rather, improved transparency and accountability. One of the things that we're really trying to get to the heart of is how do we enable um, there to be a lot of value out of annual returns and, and, and the, the information that people send to us? How do we make sure that people can actually look at that, that information and think, Oh, that does give me confidence. So some of the and some of the things that we're doing around all of that is we're working with other organisations, um, like Evaluation Support Scotland and so on, to really start thinking, how do we how do we almost build a, an, an assurance. Um, how do we enable you to all think about how you use your annual returns and annual reports for, a, for, for an assurance perspective so that people can actually read them and think not only that's a nice bunch of stories in there or that's a really nice narrative about that organisation and I can see their accounts, but we want to actually really think about what can be built in to let people have that additional level of confidence. Okay. Thank you. So in terms of how we actually regulate, taking us back into some of our core bread and butter, um, I think it is very important for people to fully understand um, what, we, what we do and, and, and what our risk framework is. Somebody uh, said, said to me quite recently, um, you know, I don't know how you, how, how you deal with looking at everything on every one of Scotland's 25,000 charities. Have you got thousands of staff sitting there doing that? No, we don't. We've got 50 of us and we do it through, 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 through a, a, a risk approach. And these are the, these are the main areas that we think are the, 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 the main ones that we want, to, we want to trigger us doing some additional deep, deep dive work. Um, we don't only do that on concerns coming in. We do that through occasional deep dives into, in, 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 into accounts or to particular thematics. But helpful, I hope, to be able to see um, the, 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 the breadth and, and to see What's what's in there? Um, they, they, you know, so some of them are so obvious. Of course, we're going to look at things if they've got criminal activity. I think the, the ones that can be less obvious to people sometimes is the lack of clarity of the charity brand. If we look at something like that, people will 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 will, will wonder why that's our concern. Well, it's got to be our concern if people actually out there don't understand what that charity is doing then people are not going to have confidence, people are not going to understand, and there can be a little bit of dubiety in there. It's one of the areas that we've had to spend a lot of time on over recent months, where people want to actually change the work that they're doing as a reaction to, 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 to the pandemic, and we're still saying, have a look at your purposes, ask us if you need to change your purposes, engage with us around all of that, but you absolutely need to have clarity about your char charity brand. That clarity of purpose is actually one of the main things that gives confidence. Okay. One of the one of the ways that we help to inc increase public trust is by making sure that we encourage every charity to use their registration logo. Um, those who were um, at, at um, the Meet the Regulator events last year will have heard us punting this quite a lot last year, and we're still trying to encourage everybody to do it because although many many thousands are, and um, there are still a few thousand um, charities who, who who aren't using it, and that seems such a missed opportunity. By using the the registration logo people can actually take a sigh of relief, know that actually you are, uh, you, you, you are part of a, a registered 
space and and and, and through and you're part of that that whole sphere of twenty five thousand charities in Scotland who are actually being regulated, and um, it does help a great deal with that. And it gives you, it, it gives your specific charity number so that if anybody wants to go in and look at it, they can do that. So if you're not using it, please do. Um, it's a available in a whole range of different shapes, spaces, colours, you name it, because again, it used to be that people were saying, oh, it doesn't go with the logos for, for, and the colour scheme for, for, for our publications. Um, well, it, it, it does now. And um, so hopefully um, you can all find one of them to be able to use. Okay, Paula. To highlight the other the breadth of support that is out there for for for, for you at, at this time is something that we wanted to 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 to, to, to do here, um, we've developed um, very specific um, COVID guidance, and that's based on the, the all of the all of the questions that are coming in, all of the queries that are coming in, everything we're hearing coming through the survey data, um, we we update it very regularly, um, and it's to make sure that it's as relevant as it possibly can be to the current questions that are coming through. Um, part of that's quite selfish. It makes it means that we don't have to answer the same question maybe a thousand times, but it is absolutely about making sure people can come in, read something, and think, "Oh, that's okay." If Oscar is saying that, that must be fine. And um, we've we're, we're we're pleased to to see very high levels of engagement with that. But we're not the only source of support, and we'd be silly to try and say otherwise. The third sector interfaces for all the local your, your local areas as well as local authorities are great sources of data, data and information, advice, help, support. Just a shoulder to cry on if you're if you're feeling a wee bit overwhelmed in there so there are many places you can go Scottish Government guidance and um, we refer back all the time to Scottish Government guidance um, and much much of our COVID guidance is, has links to that that's because what we don't want to do is to is to give you something that's going to go out of date as soon as you look at it so always steering back to what, where are we just now with, with, with the route map, where are we just now in terms of what we're actually supposed to be doing as organisations. It's a very helpful thing to do with your, with your own guidance out to your own organisations. Um, we just mentioned a few others here, the Volunteer Scotland, um, Acosvo, um, and we've got the SCVO hub down there as well. Um, the go government put a, a fair amount of funding in straight away to making sure that there was a resilience hub that is hosted by SCVO to make sure that, um, that people can go there for advice and support on furlough and all sorts of areas like that. So if you're not already using that and ours and, and, and any of these others, please have a look. Okay, so we've got so we, we've got questions that have that, that that have come in, and Paula, do you want to now take us into how we're going to handle uh, handle some of the questions that are there already, and then how we're going to handle some of the ones that have come in on the chat? Sure. Um, so we had a lot of questions come in um, while you guys were signing up, which was brilliant, and we've kind of themed them into specific areas. Um, but the first question I'm going to ask is to you, Maureen. Um, because it's very related to part of the presentation you were just talking about. So somebody would like to know, how is Oscar going to be involved in building forward differently debates or forums? The COVID-19 COVID crisis has transformed how the charity sector operate, which is an opportunity to redesign how the system works, i.e. the partnership with public services. Okay. It's very important that Oscar play, uh, play play the right role in all of this. So um, I suppose we've done quite a number of things already. One of the one of the things that, that we, we did straight away um, was to really build on the, 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 the conversations that we were having already with government. We as a non-ministerial office have a, have a unique relationship to government and to parliament. And um, so we, we want to make sure that we are um, having the sphere of influence we should have in terms of where people, what people are doing, making sure that when, 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 when we're on the very regular calls that we're on with, 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 with government in different, different spaces, that we're talking about ensuring that, that charities are at the heart of, of, of what people are doing, that we've got particular, um, we, 
we've we've got we've got individuals who are sitting and representing the sector on some of the some of the recovery groups, the various recovery groups that are there, whether it's economy, and whether it's whether it's social reform and so on. So I think our voice has been very loudly heard in, in, in all of that. We also make sure that we're, we're working with, with, with other organisations and um, we already had close working relationships with ACOSVO and SEVO um, and we, uh, so, so basically I, I, I have at least weekly calls with, 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 with my counterparts there and not only, it's not only me doing that, so Paula, you, uh, you, you have regular con contact with, 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 with the events teams across all of those. Um, Jude has, has very regular conversations with, with 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 others um, from those organisations, with Volunteer Scotland, um, with with all of those other national bodies, we're doing as much as we can to make sure that we're we're staying ahead of the game in terms of understanding where things are going, and we're building a coherence to that. And um, so, in terms of making sure that um, that, that charities are at the heart, we're talking to we're, we're talking to ministers, we're writing to to, to 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 Parliament, we're keeping everybody as informed as we possibly can, and the basis of having the and, Having the survey data really helps with an awful lot of that. Having ha having ha having that intelligence there, and the, the basis also of our frequently asked questions. You can't underestimate what um, the volume of people engaging with uh, with the work on our, on, our, on all our guidance helps with. To be able to talk about the many many thousands of people who are using that actually it lets people say, ah, oh, okay, so this this is something we should take seriously. I hope that covers um, that, 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 that covers things there. Um, Lindsay and I will be meeting. Um, we'll, we'll be meeting the, um, the cabinet secretary um, soon. We've been in regular contact there as well, and um, just always trying to make sure that everybody who needs to understand and remember the importance of charities does. Super. Thank you, Maureen. Um, this one's kind of related. It's certainly COVID related. What changes to the regulations does the regulator envisage will happen during, uh, due to COVID-19 and the increase in pressure which charities will inevitably face over the next one to three years? Jude, do you want to come in on this one? <laughs> Thank you. Um, nice and yeah, easy. Uh, I think there's a couple of things I would say. There's, there's stuff that's already within our control that I think is where we first start to make sure that we are making things as flexible, as supportive as possible for the sector to make sure that we are uh, making sure people understand what they need to do and where we can actually be flexible around different bits of our regulations. So I think that is the bit that's already under our control and, and some of the stuff that we've talked about, and I think other people will want to come in on this, but some of the stuff that we've talked about in our guidance has very much been about emphasising this is how you can work at the moment to make it as easy as possible for your charity. Um, getting regulations through is not always as easy as you, you might think, but we are trying to do some, there's some minor um, regulations around uh, bits of the scale regulations that we're hoping to get through and we are in discussions about um, other bits of um, uh, bits of regulations around dormant accounts um, and transfers of assets that we're hoping that we might be able to get through but it's a very tight timetable within Parliament. They are very stretched. And so I think we've, we, we've got to, while at the same time pursuing these different parts of, of regulation, actually what is in our power to do now and how can we work better with other organisations to make it as smooth and easy as possible for charities? That's super. Thank you, Jude. Lindsay, you'd like to come in on this? Um, I, I want to come in back on the previous question the, to, to Maureen. And Maureen spoke very well about the influence and how we deal with that. There is one part of it I think we, we should stress. We work very closely with the Scottish Government, and that is very important. But we are independent of the Scottish Government. We report to the Scottish Parliament. And one of the roles that I think we will be playing more of is to ensure that Parliament is as informed as possible in the appropriate committees about what is happening to charities from the huge amount of information that we have access to. And we will be writing to the appropriate committee in due course. But that connection is very important because at the end of the day, Parliament has a, an important role in ensuring that there's a framework that works for charities in Scotland, as well as the important work we do with Scottish Government. Thanks for that. Thank you, Lindsay. 
I'm going to move us on a wee bit to talk about um, AGMs, virtual meetings and quorums, because this was one area where the, the question bank kind of exploded, to be honest with you. So I'm going to pick um, Martin. Um, how can you hold an AGM without meeting in person? Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about this, obviously, over the, 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 the sort of period of the, the, the COVID lockdown and, and, and at the moment as well. Um, and clearly, the, 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 there's a lot more ways of uh, holding meetings or online or, or electronically or, or you know, by phone than, than there were. I think there's two sides to this. There's, there's uh, your side as, as charity trustees, and then there's, there's our side as the, as the regulator. I think in terms of your side as, as charity trustees, have a really good look at your constitution. Uh, have a look at what the legislation that affects your charity uh, says as well. So if, for instance, if, if you're a, a company, then the, the Companies Act will have helpful things to say about whether you can uh, hold meetings electronically. Does your uh, constitution specifically forbid you from uh, having meetings electronically? How much flexibility does it give you? Um, but uh, you know that, 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 that's your part of it. Have a look at what your your constitution says. Um, it's a good thing to have meetings. It's a it, it's a good thing to be getting on with the governance of your charity. Uh, as the regulator, we will take a, a very sympathetic and proportionate view uh, if we get complaints about people saying, "Oh, these people haven't quite." Uh, fulfilled the uh, the requirements of their constitution. They've gone ahead and, and uh, had an, you know, a meeting on Zoom, uh, and that their uh, their constitution doesn't quite say they can do this. We will take a very sympathetic view on that. So I, I would I would be uh, encouraging you to have a look at your constitution and uh, take the most flexible view you can of that. And we will also take a flexible view. That's great, Martin. So would you suggest then that if people are going to meet up on some technology like Zoom, for example, perhaps one of the first things they should do is to change their constitution or is that not necessary? I, I think uh, how, you know, that, that would be a, a really good thing to do. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that we've had uh, lots of queries about is uh, quorums. And I think uh, if you are having the opportunity to meet up and uh, you're able to do it, have a general look at your constitution and uh, think about whether there are changes that uh, you, you want to make that will make it easier to live with uh, the current restrictions or, or you know, the, the, the situation as it might develop in the next wee while. I think the other thing to do there uh, and, and it is to be entirely transparent about what you're doing. Uh, if you, you're deciding to, to make, uh, you know, to, to have your, uh, your meetings online, if you're deciding to make changes to your constitution, be really transparent about that. Uh, write down why you're doing it, uh, and and make sure everyone knows why you're doing it. Uh, and uh, you know, make sure your you, your members and your your stakeholders know why you're taking the measures that you're taking. And uh, if uh, in you know the long run we get people coming to us and saying, oh, they've done this, they've done that, then uh, it makes it very uh, simple for you to you know, tell us why you've done it. Um. For some people using something like Zoom, it's not going to be possible. Um, that could be because, um, for, very, for many reasons, Martin, but how, what view would we take of people voting at an AGM via email? Again, I, I think it's about uh, documenting why you're doing that, and it's about uh, showing that you've, uh, you've done that in, in, in the most responsible way, that you've been able to document uh, the votes that you've, you've, you've got, that uh, you have considered how that sits with the, the, the requirements in, in your constitution about how voting is done, uh, and uh, you're able to show that you've done that in, in, in the most sort of considered and, and, and transparent way. Thank you. Um, Jude, I'm aware that the Cora Foundation recently held their AGM online. Are you able to offer a couple of reflections about how that went? Yes, yeah, so I'll put my other hat on. I'm also a Cora trustee. Um, yes, it went it went super smoothly, uh, partly because um, it, it was something that they had been thinking about 
um, beforehand, and it was all it was all in line with with the governing document and so on. Um, and it was great. And actually, one of the things we also managed to do was sign off the documents virtually using uh, some online technology, which was really great. So I actually virtually signed it, but actually had to sign. So I think there are ways of making it smooth. Now, yeah, that was easy for Cora because of the way they were set up. But I think it'd be quite easy to make these changes in your governing document. Um, and if you're there is a certain style, I think, to online meetings, and you do need to sometimes have a bit of practice on that, and people have to facilitate in a slightly different way. But as long as you get that bit right, I think the, 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 the conversations can be really good and very fruitful. And yes, we know people struggle sometimes a little bit more with technology, but I think there's a lot of support out there, and that's one of the things I think that's very important to think about as we go forward so that charities can be as flexible as possible into the future as we sort of develop. Um, and be as resilient as possible in case something like this ever happens again, touch wood. Yeah, yeah. just to, to highlight there, uh, Jude mentioned various sources of support and that, that there's some links on the, the, the chat there, both to the, the guidance that we have and, and also things that uh, SCBO and, and some of the legal firms have. Uh, someone also mentioned uh, noting on the, the trustees report that a virtual AGM took place. That's exactly the kind of transparency that I'm talking about. Super. Um, I think we'll move on to the third area which was of interest to most people, which was reporting to Oscar. So we have a lot of people who are worried because they can't get access to their financial records. Um, they're having some issues with perhaps their auditors being furloughed or um, even being able to speak to an independent examiner. And they're also a bit concerned about explaining some of their accounts. Laura, can you just tell us, are there any penalties for not reporting on time, please? Thanks, Paula. Um, can I just check that people can hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, I'm seeing some nods, so that's good. Um, no, the first thing I would say is um, don't panic if you can't get your accounts in on time. There isn't a penalty um, if you cannot meet the nine-month legal deadline um, that is in place. We recognise and we have recognised right from the start of lockdown that many charities would have suddenly found themselves in a space whether they're trying to prepare their accounts, get them finally signed off, maybe have them audited or independently examined, that that was going to be really challenging for all sorts of reasons. And so very early on, we took the decision that what we needed to do was to provide some sort of period of grace um, for charities. We can't change the legal um, deadline for submission of accounts, which is nine months after your financial year end. That's set out in law and we haven't got an easy mechanism to make a change to that. But what is within our gift is to be relaxed and give a period of grace in terms of how we're expecting and when we're expecting charities to be able to realistically file. We're also um, looking at how we can make some changes to what shows on charities register entry if they haven't been able to meet their nine month deadline. So we're looking at being able to change hopefully the wording and the appearance of what shows on the register entry for any charity that hasn't been able to file within nine months. But I, what I would say is don't panic. We know that this is difficult. We know that you guys will be doing everything you can to get your accounts signed off or to get them audited. I would say one of the key things to, to remember is that if you're trying to go through an audit or an independent examination process at this time, work with your auditor or your independent examiner. They're trying to provide a service to you. They're trying to do a job for you. And it's going to be about trying to work out how they can best work with you through this period. That can be difficult if you're trying to provide them access to hard copy documents, for example, that might be in your office. That might be difficult. It might be very difficult for them to work out how they can do audit testing, for example, if you're getting your accounts audited. But working with them and regular communication is a really big feature of how that, those challenges can be overcome. Thanks, Laura. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about um, the register and the changes we want to make. Um, we obviously have written a piece which explains to funders how they need to look at charity accounts during this time. Um, but there are a couple of people who are um, still a little bit concerned about what's happening with the register. Yeah, thanks. It is, it is something that we are actively working on. Um, it's not a very easy change um, for us to make, um, but we do know that um, we need to, to try and get a change made. So, for example, if your charity is late in submitting its accounts at the moment, you would see a red banner appearing at the top of the register entry. So the first thing we're trying to do is to get that red banner removed. 
we'll also try and amend the wording that's on the register in terms of the dates of submission to recognise that actually your charity has not been able to file within the legal deadline because of a COVID-19 issue that you've encountered. The other thing I would particularly highlight is that um, we are working and having conversations with funders to help them understand the challenges um, that, that charities are having in this space. And I'd also highlight that um, we've got a small piece on our website as well that we've written to try and help people understand about the most useful way they can read and understand charity annual reports and accounts at the moment. Because how people look at accounts and understand them is going to be very different when a charity has had some major impact on it because of the pandemic as well. Transparent reporting is a thing that I think I've, I've been speaking about now solidly for almost 12 weeks. And I was really chuffed when someone mentioned earlier about um, should they put some extra um, information in their trustees annual report about holding their, their meetings on a virtual basis. Oh, yes, please do. In fact, please take the opportunity to explain everything that's kind of been happening to your charity in your trustees annual report. Help your readers to understand how the pandemic has actually affected the way that your charity's operated, be that the governance, the activities, the financial impact. Help people to understand and make sense of the numbers that your financial statements will show. Your trustees annual report is all about telling the story about what your charity has experienced in that year. Thank you, Laura. That's great. We've been asked an interesting question in the chat. Um, can we have a split virtual meeting with pre-recorded presentations of officers and two time slots for questions and gathering even smaller votes from both time slots? This would be easier participation for different time zones as we have members around the whole world covering 24 hours. <laughs> Jude, you laughed. It's yours now. <laughs> Martin. Um, uh, Martin, why don't you take that one because you were talking about each <laughs> I think the answer is yes and better of that than not for Edmund Martin Yeah, I think uh, again, you know, I, I, you know the, the, the boring refrain, have a look at what your constitution says, you know, is, you know does it specifically uh, you know, tell you you can't do this uh, and then work out uh, how this is going to work uh, what are the downsides of this? Are, are there risks that uh, people may misinterpret what's going on? Can you be transparent? Can uh, it be clear to all the participants what's going on? And uh, can you show, uh, uh, you know, you're talking about votes there and, 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 and voting. Can you show an audit trail as to uh, how this is done and that everything's uh, clear and transparent and above board? Um, and I, I, but I, I think it's it's about showing that in the context of your charity, the way you operate, that uh, you've you've uh, thought about the, the the upsides and the the, the downsides of uh, of doing this. What you're looking to do there is to, to have the maximum sort of meaningful participation from the the, the members of your charity and, and the, the, the the trustees, uh, and balance that against the the, the risks of the, the complexity of what you're looking to do there. Thank you. Um, Laura, John would like to know, can we submit a report without financial information? If so, then how so? Um, okay, um, it's a good question because I imagine the question has arisen because of a difficulty to access financial information which allows um, a set of accounts to be prepared. But actually the two should really come hand in hand because the words are really what help makes a reader um, make sense of the numbers, I guess, in many respects. So ideally, the two should really come together. It's really all about the numbers and the words all coming together to tell the story of exactly what has happened in the year. So if that means that the, the filing for that charity is going to be a bit late, then I think so be it, but better that we have all the information in the one go. Thank you, Laura. Martin, can you tell us, is Oscar able to look at new charity applications at the moment? Yes, we very much are, and uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that the number of new applications dipped quite sharply uh, in uh, March and April. It, it's starting to go up again a little bit now, uh, but yes, we, we, we've been uh, carrying on, real, carrying on really with all our casework uh, right through the lockdown period. Thank you. Um, one of the the questions that came through. Um, from the event right page was around is there a rising number of charities are we seeing a growth in charities over the last kind of three years martin um the number of, of charities on the the, the the register is is going up um 
that uh, that's a, a, a new development, I think, because for the first sort of 10 years or so that we were in existence, the, the, the number of, of new charities was pretty much in balance with the number of charities coming off the register through you know, dissolution or, or whatever. Uh, the number seems to be sort of gently curving upwards. I'm not sure whether that's necessarily a, um, uh, a reflection of more charitable activity or, or, or more new charities uh, being formed or uh, other factors, you know, charities um, you know, being longer lived or, or uh, whatever, but the, 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 the numbers are going up very, very gently. Jude, do you want to add anything to that? Well, yeah, I'm just going to come in and say that, you know, we're always, we, we are looking at perhaps taking a slightly more uh, proactive stance on some of the, the, the longer term charities that are on there that, that perhaps have not been active for a while and we'll be doing some work around that. Um, but I do think it's something we said over the last two to three years. When I first came into this role, it was static and it is beginning to gently go up. And I think we need to do a bit of digging to understand why that is because it would be quite nice to know if that's a real trend upwards or if there are other reasons why, why that's the case. Super. Okay, we're actually a little bit ahead of time. We've got an extra five minutes. So I think we'll move on to the, to the next presentation so that we're able to have an extra five minutes in the breakout rooms later on. So Jude, Cameron, can we get started? Yes. I'll wait for my slides. There we Great. go. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to have a chance to talk about these surveys publicly. This is the first time we've really had that chance. Um, and I want to point out in a way that these are sort of headlines at the moment and there's a lot more work that we're doing behind the scenes to understand a bit more the subtleties and the nuances of the surveys. Um, so if you just move to the next slide, Cameron, what we're going to do today is uh, talk a little bit about why we did the surveys. Um, it's always good to understand that. Uh, some of the headline findings around that and then a little bit of reflection on how that might help us shape the support going forward. A lot of these are more questions and reflections than, 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 than firm ideas, but they're things that we're beginning to think about and to talk about with our partners, with Scottish Government and so on. And I think there's a question then about 12 months and beyond. You've seen this slide, so why did we take the surveys? Um, basically, whenever we do a piece of work, we have to weigh up what's the benefit um, against what might be the cost in terms of burden to the sector or, or whatever. Um, but we are very uniquely placed in at the moment to be able to talk to the whole sector, that whole wide sector that Maudie was talking about. Um, and while there was other bits of research going on, other bits of subsector research going on, we felt this was a great opportunity to be able to talk to that wide range of organisations and to get a bit of a sense where they were at, what the impacts were, and what they were feeling about the future. So I think it's even more important when we think about how that sector is spread across Scotland, it reaches into every part of Scottish life. This is a lovely slide. Uh, we know that most of the charities are bunched in some ways in the big urban centres, but if you look at charities per head of population, it's a much more even spread. So they are spread across the whole of Scotland. And if we just move to the next slide, one of the things that we always have to bear in mind is the way in which charities are um, really heavily represented, Maureen commented on this already, by the small charities. 53% of charities have an income of less than £25,000. And that means that they, some, a lot of those charities might not be linked up so well to other intermediate bodies, to other groups. And we have a direct channel to be able to talk to these charities, which often play a very important role in local, local communities across Scotland. So we decided it was worth doing the survey. And so what did we do? Basically, we wrote to all our principal contacts uh, across Scotland um, and we asked them to take part in the, the survey. We gave them a very short turnaround time and we have to thank our partners, Breaking Blue, who did the work for us, who really helped make that as smooth as possible. And we were absolutely delighted to get almost 5,000 responses. So 480,000 4,480,000, that would be a lot. 4,827 usable responses we got. So that was absolutely amazing. And as Lindsay said, it's a big thank you to everybody who filled that out. 
Now, what was extremely good about the actual way in which people responded to this is that we ended up having a pretty representative sample across the board. Now, you will know any of you who are involved in research, if you want a representative sample, you have to spend quite a lot of time building that sample. Well, we didn't. We just flung the invitation out there and what came back was a fairly representative sample of the charity sector. There's a small difference, say for instance, in the respondents, um, if you look at the respondents' income, under £2,000, uh, there's 8% 8, 8 uh, response there, and there's 17% of those on the, on the charity register. So there's a little difference there, not surprising, these are the very tiny, tiny micro charities, but still an 8% response from, from, from them was fantastic. So as you see, if you look at the rest of the graphs, the way they swoop, is very similar to the way they would swoop if we just uh, if we looked at the, the register as a whole. So we were delighted with that response. So what did we ask about? Um, it wasn't rocket science, obviously. We asked about the impact. What, what did that mean in the way that charities were able to operate and how were they responding to that? We, we went a little bit into volunteers and that's been great because that, that, that that those figures will be used by a lot of people. And we talked a little bit about financial threat and so on. So the, that was what mainly what we asked on. And what I'm going to do is just to share a few of the results, remembering that below that is a massive data set that we will do a lot more work on, but we will also be uh, giving other people access to so they can go into absolute micro detail on some of the areas, for instance, volunteering. So, um, moving on, so how are charities being affected? If you look at this slide, I've got two slides here about how charities are being affected because one of them reflects the severity of how they've been affected. But a massive number of charities had to postpone or cancel events, not surprisingly. Um, linked to that, but also a sort of linked but slightly different is the whole loss of income from fundraising because many of these events might have been fundraising events so 51 percent and if you add to that the lost income from trading 42 percent or other sources of fundraising what you're seeing not surprisingly is a, a big decrease in money coming into the sector over this period Linked to that, you have the whole disruption of support serv or services to beneficiaries, which is sitting at 42%. Now that's a pretty high number, but what's more worrying about that is if you dig down a little bit, eh, two sectors were more affected, housing and eh, mental health services, where there was a higher level of impact. And that can be quite serious when we're thinking about some of the impacts of the of the, of the COVID um, crisis itself and what that means for people out there and beneficiaries out there. So that's what I mean when I say below these headline figures, there will be other figures that will help us influence debate, talk to the right people, make sure the right information is getting out there. If you go down to the, further, the, the, the other blue ones that have been highlighted, they're all really things that you know Oscar ha has had lots of questions on, we hold dear to our heart, uh, governance issues, uh, we've talked a lot today about AGMs and that is reflected in the survey. People at that stage were unable to hold them or were worried about holding them. Um, charities struggling to actually just meet uh, and again that's very difficult if you want to govern your charity well and at a time in crisis when you have some big decisions to make. Um, and then if you look at the reserve question, and that's something we do want to do more work on, because what you're seeing there is 30% saying it's affecting the reserves, as you would expect, because reserves are built up exactly for this kind of crisis. But what does that mean for charities going forward? And we know there's some issues about charities who have got strong reserves, but of course they're the ones who are not getting emergency funding. So how sugarly does that make them going forward? So Cameron, if you just move to the next slide, and that just shows you that for some of these, they were severely affected, very much are severely affected. So again, it just reflects the same kind of issues, mostly loss of fundraising and planned work or events postponed. So what you're seeing is a, a sector that has been highly impacted, not surprisingly, by COVID, and that, is, um, and that is, has affected both their operations, but it's also affected their ongoing work and their future work because it's affected fundraising. So moving on to the next one, how has charities responded? And there are some pleasing things here, not surprisingly. 
we know from the charity sector that there's a great deal of flexibility and that people do try to keep functioning even in the most difficult circumstances. So for a lot of charities, what they've managed to do is to provide remote support. So 47% saying they've managed to provide remote support. That's great. And 28% said they've managed to adapt to meet their beneficiaries' needs. However, you're also seeing 36% of charities not being able to operate, having to stop operations. And then you've also seen a very interesting figure, and we're going to talk a little bit more about volunteers, that 32% had to reduce or cease their use of volunteers. So these are quite interesting figures, a very active response, but also some very serious impacts in terms of the ability to offer the services that charities might, might otherwise be offering. So volunteers, um, and uh, already Volunteer Scotland are looking at this in a little bit more detail, and we'll have lots more information on this. But it is quite interesting, and it raises some quite interesting questions, I think, for future situations where we might be in, in, in crisis. Um, so for 37%, that's quite interesting, it had no effect. So that might be charities who have long-term volunteers, were able to redeploy them, were able to employ them in, some, you know, in, in their ongoing activities. That's quite a high number. But there's 18% who saw a major decrease in the number of volunteers, and there's very few that saw an increase in number of volunteers. Now, we don't know, there's, there's a lot more discussion to have around this, but we know that at the same time that, that, that these figures were being gathered, there was a massive number of people who were putting themselves forward as volunteers. Um, and, and the charity sector per se has not been able to absorb them in the numbers that were, that, that were put out there. We, we all know how many people wanted to actually do something. Now, there's lots of positive reasons for that. I think a lot of people got involved in more informal volunteering. But what does that mean? Do we, un we need to understand this in more detail so that we can think about how, if something in the future how do you tap that reserve of people who are ready and willing and able to get involved in, 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 a, in a response situation to such a major crisis? Financial threat. So obviously this is a biggie. So uh, I don't know if I said that with a cheery voice because it's not necessarily cheery. Um, for, for some people, they've seen this slide and said, well, actually, I would have thought that might have been a bit worse. So, you know, that there is a sense in which that is true and some of the figures that came from other bits of research much earlier on had that critical in 12 months figure being slightly higher but 20 percent of charities that took part in this survey said that they were likely to have a critical point at some time in the next 12 months so that's one fifth of all charities so that is somewhat worrying and then if you look at the next one some threats 65 percent again that is a pretty high number and it will depend on how we respond over the next few months, how critical that becomes over the next 12 to 24 months, that kind of middle, that middle uh, band of people who are being affected but not quite so severely. So these are very fa fairly high numbers and that would absolutely be expected. You know, your fundraising has gone down, you're not able to trade, um, it's very likely you have less money. If you've got, if you're already eating into your reserves, it could become a critical situation for you. Moving on, and this just reflects something similar about your ability to actually work over the next period. And Cameron, the last one, which just shows it in a nice pie chart, it just shows the 20% and the 80%. And when you look at it like that, it looks like quite a big chunk. So we just have to be aware of that. And again, what we don't know is um, we, the, the survey is always at a moment in time. Things will already moved on. And one of the things that we are going to do is to repeat this survey or you know, something very similar within the next six months to see where charities have gotten to and to actually assess how much of this is becoming critical and, and then feeding that that information in as well. We asked about the sources of health and advice and what people were using. So I think very rightly, a Scottish government comes out and talk, that's great. People have been looking at it and using it. I think the second uh, line there is very, very important for us all, for us as a public body, for everybody else. It comes out a second, you know, actually getting your information off Twitter, off LinkedIn, off Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, off Instagram. That's where the information is coming from for people, for the majority, for many people. 
So are we making sure that we're making the most of these? We, we have been trying over the last few years to do that, but we just, you know, that we have to continue that journey because obviously that is the route in for many people eh, and particularly for younger people into getting information. And then we are third. So we were quite happy about that. There's an interesting stat there though. So it's quite a lot of people who've seen our stuff. 25% uh, have used it. What we don't know if, if that 55% didn't use it because they didn't need it or they didn't use it because it wasn't any good. So there's a bit more work for us to do to actually understand that figure. But we're very pleased that people are looking at our website, looking at our guidance and then hopefully using it if they need to, to make sure they're doing the right things. And then as you would expect, there's lots of other um, good sources of advice and support that are mentioned there. And then when we get to the sort of um, the, the, the kind of support from, from your funder bodies or from the bodies that you work closely with, you've got um, quite a high level for funders. And we've seen that over the piece. The funders have been very engaged in discussions with charities, a lot of them lessening the restrictions on their funds or taking restrictions away um, and trying to be as uh, flexible as possible where it's possible for them to do so. Um, and I think the charity sector has been appreciating that. Second one local authority such an important source of support for the charity sector and this is an area that we want to do engage much more with that local authority level where charities have a have a very direct relationship with the local authority and making sure that they have the information they need to make the right decisions around that and then interestingly your accountant comes out third so that's good people are using the experts that they have to make sure they're doing the right things and then as we always direct people to the third sector interface, so it's worth a shout out to them because they can come out as fourth on that list of, of, of people, of, of sources that have been directly tapped into. Um, I'll just go through these, the next one's uh, relatively fast because we just asked about what kind of support people were using, what kind of support people were, 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 were tapping into. And not surprising again your local authority funding independent grant funding and the specific funds that were were were, were run by scottish government around well-being um, around um, uh, the sporting communities fund and so on they, and the third sector resilience fund they all come out there as something that people have either used or would consider using in the future now that's quite interesting because of course some of these funds will not be available in the, in the future so what what is going to be in place for charities who are going to be needing a little bit more financial support over the next period? And these are the discussions that we would get involved with around that. And then the non-funded non support. Um, interestingly, the top one is information and advice. So charities just want to make sure they're getting the information, they're getting signposted the right way, um, and guidance. Guidance is the second one, which is sort of relatively similar to the top one. So do people know what they need to do, how they can do it. And then the third one, which we talked a little bit about today already, is how flexible uh, can we be as a public body, but maybe others as well, in terms of filing and reporting deadlines. Um, and we've tried to take that very seriously and make sure we are being as flexible as we possibly can be within the, the strictures of our, of, our, um, of our legislation. We asked the question, what else would you need or like or the support uh, from us um, and from other support organizations and there was quite a high number that, that they're relatively they're, they're lower percentages but you know continue with the support so there is a sense in which there are some signals that the support that has been offered both by us and by other support organizations has been relatively good over the period so not resting on laurels not thinking that we've done everything that we can do but saying that's great how can we build on that and make sure that that's what we're doing over the next six months over the next year and then the people say no you don't have nothing don't do anything else so that's that's quite nice but we do there's a lot more that we could be doing so we will continue to explore that and then not surprisingly the ones come out again about general funding support and about more flexibility now this that was a massive data set so this is very much a hired line data and we want to dig a little bit more into that because it was a an open question and there may be other interesting things in there right 
So I'm, get, I'm, I'm coming to the end of this now because we're going to have a chance to have a, a chat with a, a few people in breakout rooms. But what I tried to do then was think a little bit about, well, what's that saying in terms of how the conversation should, we should be having about how to support charities over the next period, over the next uh, 12 months? I think the first thing to say is just to repeat that we think that we've got good information here, but we feel that we need to build on that information by, by doing the surveys again in the future um, and making sure that the, the information is updated. Um, because some of the impacts will not be felt for, for many months down the line. It, what's it going to look like for charities whose, whose events are not just cancelled now, but are cancelled for the rest of the year? Um, what, uh, what's, what it's going to mean in terms of fundraising? How, how long is it going to take for fundraising to take an upward, um, an upward trajectory? What does it mean for organisations that haven't been trading? Are they going to manage to get that trading income back in? I talked a little bit about the reserves, and that's definitely something that we think is, is very important to be concentrating on. And we've got a role to play in that, and we can certainly share good information and, and have good conversations around that, and how to support charities to, to, to build in risk and resilience to what they're doing. And then there's all these in the governance questions, and that's definitely something that we have to concentrate on, making sure that we're being as clear as possible with charities about governance information, um, and making sure that we're working with others to understand both uh, what's good practice in governance, but also probably to be forward thinking about building that flexibility in governance for the future so that charities are well placed should they have to be in another situation like this in the, in the future. There's a lot more work to be done to look at the vulnerable groups. I, I mentioned mental health charities because that's something that leapt out at us. But there will be other groups in there and we need to try to dr drill down a little bit, both us and then when we share the information, other people, so that we can have a, a good conversation about sort of more targeted support going forward. What are the contingencies around some of these more tricky areas where support is going to be needed for the next six months, a year, more support is going to be needed, uh, but there's, there's less money and there's less and, and the, there's just less resilience. So how do we support that, those sectors? Um, and then just planning for the future. Um, I've mentioned uh, us thinking about doing the, 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 the surveys again. And I also think it's just good to remember that one of the main things that will be different here is what's happening in different sectors, but it's also what is happening in different sizes of charities, large and small and so on. So getting that analysis and making sure that we're making the most of the information that we have. And that links to the whole issue of funding and non-funding support. And I've sort of mentioned this already. Um, the, 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 there have been some interesting conversations around the different funding streams that have come out. Some charities, there may even be some in this audience where, because they've got good reserves, haven't been able to access certain funding streams, what does that mean for them going forward? How can we support the thinking around that with government and with local government? And making sure we're talking in a tailored way, making sure we're understanding what it might mean to be the best support possible for different parts of the sector. And then what happens after that emergency funding and, and specific government measures go? What are we going to do then? How, how are charities going to survive? Do we understand that? Do we understand the impacts? And I think the second survey will be very helpful in trying to help us make those assessments. In terms of the, 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 the work around charities responding and what they've done, um, it's been great that so many charities have responded digitally, but we know that many charities are not, um, a, are not so comfortable sometimes in the digital space. There is support out there, uh, making sure these bits are linked up so charities are feeling comfortable and feeling able to use that virtual space going forward. Um, we need to think about if there are going to be charities that are a bit struggling and need to think about winding up, how do we support them to do that in an orderly way so that we're making sure that we have the best chance possible of keeping at charitable assets is safe and that we're not making it a difficult, complicated process, but we're being a supportive and well, an enabling regulator even in that slightly depressing phase of winding up. I mean, is everything is the information straightforward enough? If one of the main things that charities need is information and guidance, do they understand the information and guidance that is out there? Are we asking the right questions? Are we giving the right answers? And making sure that that is, is as good as it possibly can be. 
in the 12 months and beyond that, I'm just going to actually concentrate a bit on the maintaining trust and transparency in tough times. Because I think one of the things that happens in a crisis and when your accounts start to look a little bit more, a bit more fragile and when things are not looking so positive and you can't talk about the impact you're having, maybe the, the impulse for some people is to try and kind of cover that up. But we are all in the same boat and making sure that you're being transparent about what's going on is by far the best thing because people will absolutely understand and if you're being upfront about what's going on with your charity that is the best possible way of making sure you're keeping the trust and confidence that your your members your beneficiaries the wider public have in your charity making sure that you can and therefore that you can call on that in the future the volunteers i'm just going to say i just think there's a lot of interesting conversations to have around that uh, and thinking how we can make sure we can make the most of volunteers uh, both over the next few years but actually thinking about the future proofing what do we do in the future to make sure that we can make the most the best possible use of, of volunteers that, that really want to respond. There's such an outpouring of energy and, and, and desire to help when something like this happens. So are we making the most of it? And how can we feed in to the people who are doing lots of work on this so that they have as good information as possible in terms of how we support that going forwards? And then help and advice, making sure it's accessible, making sure we're reaching the people who are hard to reach. And these are sometimes the tiny charities. There's sometimes people who have become disengaged. So how are we doing that? And then making sure we're working out, well, is there some specific support that we can go do, some specific guidance to specific groups and so on. So making sure that that is happening. And then thinking about our partnerships, thinking about how we work with different people going forwards to try and help build as, as, as resilient a charity population as possible going forward. And I think that's me. And I hope that wasn't too fast. And I hope there was a, it's touched on some of the areas that might be interesting for you. I would just finish by saying thanks again to everybody who took part, but also to say there's much more to come on this. This is great information. We've got great data there and we will be using it to make sure that we can help shape the support to the charity sector going forward. Thank you. Okay, Jude, thank you. That's great. Um, as has been mentioned, we're going to pop into some breakout rooms now. Um, we don't want to set a kind of homework for you but we thought what might be helpful is if you have a reflection on the the results that you've heard from the survey um what kind of support do you guys need can you let us know and you know we, we've already asked in the surveys what do the next 12 months look like but actually what about past 12 months how's that going to look for your organization okay so i've set this up so that we've got um, 20 minutes on the clock. Shortly, you will all disappear off into a room. Um, there will be a Oscar board member or staff member in the rooms with you. And you'll have 20 minutes. You will get a countdown timer one minute before the session is due to finish. Um, and then you will automatically pop back into the main session. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope that you had a good chance to have a bit of a conversation um, with some people that you hopefully haven't met before. Um, and I hope that whatever that conversation was, was helpful. Um, we only have 15 minutes left of the session, so it's quite hard to, to hear too many reflections, but I wonder if, um, if the Oscar staff members want to um, reflect back any points or some questions from the main room, one or two, and I will, I will ask you each to, to pop in as, you, as we go along. So Maureen, um, would you like to kick us off, please? I think I'm unmuted now, am I? Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, really helpful session. Um, we, the main thing that was coming through was the, the, the variability and the diversity. We had, we, we had 
the, the, the huge impacts on some charities um, where, where um, everything that they had planned for this year has been decimated and it's how to actually come back and recover from that, how to keep on lobbying, how to keep on making sure that your voices are being heard while you're keeping everybody on board and, and come up with lateral and pragmatic solutions. So there was some very interesting so, so, so solution focused stuff coming through. Um, some really nice things about um, people being able to deliver new services and I think a really interesting part about a lot more young volunteers coming through to certain organisations and how do you make sure that you don't just say well thanks for that and move on from that when this is over, how do you capitalise on holding on to those young volunteers, encourage them to become board members, encourage them to, to really see themselves as a long term part of the solution. Um, there was also a specific request for um, for 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 a, a lot a, a lot of us um, support bodies be kind of pulling back and um, starting to simplify the messages um, because there were there were an awful lot of messages coming through about how you could do lots of things whether it was coming from umbrella bodies into midiri bodies and different other bodies um, and people thinking wow I used to think I just wanted to be a, a volunteer but this sounds very very complicated and it's pretty hard work being a volunteer these days when it's all so detailed and overwhelming so um, it was a, a very very helpful session. Thank you, Maureen. Jess, I have you next on my list, please. Uh, yes, we had a good session. Um, we talked quite a bit about AGMs and some positive examples. Oh, excuse the noise in the background. That's my children. They're just sorting themselves out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they'll be fine. Um, so no, we talked about AGMs um, and some positive examples. We also talked a bit about um, at least one um, organisation in our group had um, looked at the Resilience Fund but hadn't been able to get it um, because basically they were too robust at the time um, and so there was a bit of frustration around you know lack of kind of forward planning and thinking about well if you can see ahead that you are going to have problems you know then it would be useful if you could access support and, and plan for that and just wondering um, you know what Oscar might be able to do about um, influencing some of that thinking from from funders and from funders more generally in terms of um attitudes from funders um towards charities more generally that's super thank you very much jess jude you are next on my list well um no it was lovely nice to have a chat um a couple of things i think interesting to reflect on that whole sectoral nature of how the impacts are different so we had uh, somebody from the cultural sector putting on musical events and how that's really tricky um but also quite a big reflection on you know thinking about the fact that when we did the surveys perhaps people were slightly more optimistic about how how when this would actually end and how optimistic they were for the future so in fact yes there might be different impacts than they had thought when they actually filled in the survey so we were actually talking to people who filled in the survey so that whole idea of looking further forward and what that means um, and then yes we did have a couple of questions around governance and stuff like that but just lovely to sort of have that close-up chat and just remembering how different it is for different organizations and how we need to be very forward thinking and look much further in the future in terms of the impacts Thank you, Jude. Um, Ross, you're next on my list. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, again, um, just to echo that of those who went before, some good discussion. Um, there was one question that was raised which I felt would be beneficial for the answer to be wider heard rather than just within the within the group um, and perhaps more detail provided than, than I could provide on it. So it's maybe um, one to share, Paul. It was regarding the future of charities and um, we obviously know of the funding and support that's available at the moment one of the questions was raised regarding oscar's engagement with scottish government about any potential future funding for into next year etc and how much influence um, oscar may have on that that is an excellent question um maureen can i ask you to come in on this one please oh i'm gonna need to unmute you bear with me while i scroll There we are. Thanks, Paula. Certainly, what we're doing is we're 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 having very regular conversations with those in in, in Scottish government who are looking after the various funds, um, and they they, they were 
to say they were delighted when they knew that we were doing the survey so that they could actually have meaningful data to, to, to actually base a lot of their considered discussions on. Um, you know, the, 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 they, they will say sensible things like there isn't an infinite pot. Um, there, uh, you know, we, we won't have lots of funding streams just com, 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 coming, popping out of nowhere. But what they want to do is actually base um, what's, what, what happens next on the, on, on the considerations of, this, of, of the data. Um, and we're having those conversations. So let's let us be very clear in terms of the things that we understand about those who, um, when, when I talk to them, I say, the, so, so organizations feeling penalized because they've actually been able to do the right thing, organizations feeling that they're, they're, they're being more honest, um, or organizations feeling that they're trying to be lateral and, 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 and well, well thought through, while well, well others um, are, 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 are just able to, to say, well, thank goodness we weren't doing as well last year because we can, we, we can get money. Um, these things are difficult because it can feel very competitive and people want to look after their organizations and we're trying to work closely um, with government colleagues to enable them to understand um, what they what they can do and what's actually required out in the sector so the the, 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 the survey data and the, the frequently asked questions data and everything else we have like that and all the colleagues we've talked to worth its weight in gold um, I think going back to Lindsay's point um, that, that, that was very well made at the beginning of the session it's very very helpful that we are independent of government um, so uh, we have we we have that, that that close dialogue with them, but we're not we're we're not sitting as part of government. So it's our job to actually take that data, take that informed intelligence that we have, and help them to come to the best considered responses with it. And we can say things that that others can't because we're not you know although although our money comes through government to actually fund us, we're not part of them and we're not beholden. So um, we will say um, fairly unpalatable things if it's required um, to make sure that the points are fully understood. Thanks, Maureen. Just while I've got you there, um, we've had a question through the chat that I think is quite a good one. Um, Alan is wondering if you're advising charities to plan for both A, a new or near normal scenario, and B, contingencies for a further lockdown. I saw that question coming up and I thought that's a great question, Alan. I really like that one. So I'm glad I got that one. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, it's got. It's it's it, uh, bluntly. It's got to be both. You know where we where we all thought we were two months ago at the beginning of all of this. Where we all think we're going now. Where we'll all think we're going by one o'clock today when people have heard um, Mr. Swinney. This is a moving feast, and this is a changeable area. And what, what I think that what I think staff, volunteers, trustees should all be considering is. How do we how do we reasonably operate over the next while? In some ways, the the, the best the, the best thing can be to 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 do it in 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 reasonable chunks. Um, you know what 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 will we be doing over? What are the priorities over the summer, or what are the priorities till October? What are the priorities through to the end of the year? What's it going to be for Plan A, for Plan B, or Plan C? And these things are going to keep moving. I think um, I would really encourage everybody to go back and, and have a proper look at the at the government route map and to use that to really genuinely try to position what your organization has found itself doing and could be doing that quite differently through that and certainly um from 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 an oscar perspective one of the things we're doing and as an organization and the charity regulator is we're looking at our own transitions so we have a transition group that's made up of a cross-sectoral group of staff who are working alongside our senior management team to think through what should we be doing as a as priorities for for our staff for where, where we should be based what we should be doing and um, what we're going to do to celebrate all the flexibility of home working and um, what we're going to have to reprioritize if we can do certain things we're thinking about our, our, our events in certain ways we've made up our minds that we'll do we'll do a, our, our events through at least to the end of the year in this way um, we've all got to have plan a plan b responses to it and i think that's only reasonable so yes i think um if people were saying oh, they're only thinking about new, the, the 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 fingers crossed it'll all be okay that'd be terrible and contingencies for a further lockdown well i think we, so many of us found ourselves 
in this much, much faster than we considered. Now, if anybody is talking, people are saying that we may have second waves, we may have all sorts of things. We simply don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is that it would be very, um, it, 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 would, it would be, it would be pretty, pretty difficult for trustees to sit and say, oh, we decided we weren't going to bother thinking about that. You know, if, if we're being told there's a strong potential of a second wave or a different wave in, 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 in the winter especially, why would we not be getting ready for that? So I would be expected to see the discussions and the decisions on all of that sort of really sensibly um, logged. And, 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 and even if you can't come up with the answers, the fact that you're considering and you know that you're going to be thinking it through. Thank you. Okay, um, Wendy, you're next on my list, please. Um, yes, I had a lovely chat. Thank you, folks that were in my my chat room. Um, so we um, we chatted a bit about AGMs, and people seem to be finding kind of you know ways of doing them, um, and seem to be kind of pretty upbeat about those. Um, uh, uh, a good story about a charity that um, actually feel that they have benefited from this because they have had to go virtual and people that would have been reluctant to um, consider these um, IT and technology alternatives have uh, now thoroughly embraced them and are finding it very positive and beneficial um, particularly the sort of the virtual coffee mornings um, so um, the other thing was um, a concern, um, which I'd like to pass over to one of our senior managers, if I may. Um, it was to do with um, being able to maintain the level of charitable activity um, and, you know, um, or should I say the question is, what happens if we can't maintain our level of charitable activity? Martin, do you want to take that one, please? Yeah. Uh, and I, I suspect this will be a, something that uh, will, will, will be affecting a, a lot of charities. I think it's, it's about having a, a, a really uh, honest and, and clear think about uh, is that likely to be a short term uh, problem? You know, is, is it something that uh, you know, will, 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 be, you know, will resolve itself as, as we come out of lockdown? Are there longer term implications for how you operate and whether you're able to operate uh, what uh, what does it mean in in the, the the context of your charity and having an honest discussion amongst yourselves and uh, I think making a a a, 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 you know, a, a positive uh, having a, a sort of positive discussion about uh, what to do rather than uh, simply letting things don't let things slide don't think let things run into the sand if you uh, think you know it's going to be a pause with uh, what you can do. Then I think be transparent with people about that and, and make it clear in, in your annual report and, and, and in your reporting to Oscar and, and that's helpful to us. Uh, if you think that's going to be a, a permanent thing, if you think no, it, it's not going to be feasible for us to continue, then the, the, the responsible thing to do as a trustee is to uh, have a, a, an orderly managed uh, you know, way of, of uh, you know, closing the, 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 the charity down and making sure that the resources it has and the enthusiasm of its volunteers uh, it, you know, does uh, good elsewhere in, in, in the sector. So it's, it's about, I think it's, it's about having honest and, and clear conversations about where you are with, with what you're able to do. Super. Thank you, Martin. Do you want to give us feedback from your room? Is there anything that hasn't been covered so far? I think one of the interesting things uh, people have moved on to to uh, virtual ways of doing things in, in you know in, in really interesting and, and, and different ways. But there, there's, there's a word of caution about that. There are limits to that, and and you know uh, one of the survey results was particularly relevant there. That was about the the the, uh, the effect on on charities working with mental health, and that, that there are limits on on. Uh, what you can do without that one-to-one, -one, you know, in-person contact with with with, with uh, people who are, are you know having difficulty with that with their mental health, and uh, you know you can't go entirely virtual there. Uh, the, 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 there are limits on that. That's super. Thank you, Martin and um, Jill. Thanks, Paula. In the, in the interest of time, I'll just pick out a, a couple of points from the, the really interesting discussion we had in our group. We had a couple of auditors on the group and, and we were talking about the, the fact that about 
six months ago or so when when people were developing their plans for the year ahead that the, there was very little in there in the risk registers in terms of what you would do in the event of a three-month lockdown and a reflection that actually perhaps we all ought to have been thinking a bit more about the, the, the types of risks that a pandemic might bring but as we look forward of course we'd expect to see something quite different now in terms of the types of things that people put in, in risk registers. We talked also about reserve policy and, and the fact that those who, who perhaps had held on to reserves often perhaps under pressure to be to, to, to be spending more we're are probably now in a much better position and that again might change people's approach to, to reserves going forward. And and the final point I would make and it was I've noticed it's in the chat bar as well is that the this type of virtual event that Oscar's hosted I think has gone down well and there was a, a call for us to do more like this, not just during the course of the rest of this um emergency situation that we find ourselves in but but going forward as well super thank you very much jill i'm really conscious that we've already hit the the 12 o'clock mark there's still a little bit of feedback to give so if you guys don't mind we're going to continue for another 10 minutes or so and um, for those of you who have to leave just now just to let you know there will be a short survey coming out um in about five minutes to your inbox this will give you an opportunity to provide feedback to us, but also if there is a question, a burning question that you haven't managed to have answered today, um, you can pop that question into the survey and one of the staff or myself will come back to you. Um, so if you're all okay to stay, then next on my list is Stuart Cross, please. Right, thanks Paula. Uh, I'll, I'll be trying to be brief. Lots of very similar points to what we've heard uh, already. Variable impact across differing sectors. Uh, some of the restrictions on virtual uh, technology, particularly mental health support and others. Two or three specific points that came out. A um, couple of contributors in the, the sort of broader heritage sector making the point that they anticipate a bit of a lag even when they do get back to activities that allow them to trade and, and making the point that actually they're reliant on other regulators so for example safety and health inspections and some of those other regulators are actually furloughed so there's going to be a real backlog of in inspections from other regulators before they can actually get running again so that interface with other regulators was quite important and the impact on timing um, that point came through. Uh, a point about health and social care partnerships already engaging in revisiting commissioning plans and getting involved in some decommissioning. We heard a story of one uh, provider that's had to close down because it was decommissioned and the services passed on to somebody else. So commissioning and decommissioning was coming up. Um, and then a final point on technology which was one that's close to my own part and which a few of us shared, a plea for consistency across local and central government. Can they please start to make their minds up whether they believe Zoom is a good or bad thing? Um, Lindsay Montgomery will appreciate my comments on that one. So um, some challenges around particularly local authorities, some saying, yes, it's okay to use Zoom, others saying, no, it's not okay to use Zoom. So a variety of points from us. That's super. Thank you very much, Stuart. Stephanie, can I ask you to come in next? I'm terribly sorry. I thought you'd already left. No, I'm, I'm still here. I do have another meeting at 12, but I am still here to give our feedback from our room, which we had a great discussion. Um, one of the things I would say is that um, from our breakout room, there were people for whom technology, you know, actually access, depending on where you are and how good your broadband is. Um, can be a challenge. So, so actually moving everything onto an online thing for some people is, is a challenge, just, just nothing to do with whether they can use it or not, just whether they can access or not. Um, the other thing is we were talking about, um, a few people have been going through audits during this time, um, and the auditors have been sometimes using OSCAR to um, say, no, 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 we can't do that virtually because Oscar require us to actually see things like stock or whatever it might be. And I just wanted to bring that to the big group because Martin, you had said earlier that Oscar are trying to be as 
um, supportive and helpful in this current time. And, and I had suggested that, you know, a quick email or phone call to, to Oscar might have cleared that up. And that sometimes auditors saying, well, we must do this because Oscar insists on it. Sometimes it's worth just clarifying, particularly at this point. The, the other point that I thought was really interesting in our group was the difficulty of ongoing financial projections. So again, this came out of the experience of people being audited and auditors wanting to ask questions around going concern and wanting ever more fan, um, detailed financial projections, when in fact, we are in a situation where things are changing, frankly, on a monthly basis. You know, the example is if the furlough scheme changes, that has huge implications on people's ongoing financial projections. So, um, so what, what our group tended to do was, you know, the trustees tend to be meeting more. They tend to be looking more closely at ongoing budgets. But, but the idea of probably where we were all this time last year, that we were sitting with a, a budget for the year ahead, is not practical in today's, um, in today's operating climate. So that, I just, that was just the feedback from our group. It's a great group. Thank you, Paula, for organising it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for staying on for that extra five minutes after your meeting as well. Um, Shona, can I introduce you next, please? Yep, that's fine. We had also a great chat in our group. Um, the feedback was that the survey results were perhaps a bit more optimistic than um, some of the participants expected. I think there's a timing issue definitely there in terms of exactly when they were um picked up but also wondered how oscar would use the that information for example with scottish government um and the fact that looking ahead we some charities will face a situation where there's very increased demand particularly if there's a rise in unemployment um and also think about charities that support people that are shielding that may still be shielding for a period of time so really how how will that data be used to inform and advise government to support charities as uh, so we had a chat about that um, one of the participants in our room um, uh, was from the Royal Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland and I hope I've got the name correct James I hope I said that right but obviously a really large scale events um, and really looking for guidance on you know how do you deal with 50,000 people coming through to an event going forward and what does that look like and the knock-on impact not being able to do that has on other charitable work that they for free educational work in the schools obviously I haven't got that um, so looking for guidance and that I know a smaller charity looking for guidance around about so just really practical things about distancing so for example they have a time list members of the public can come into the office, should be putting up screens, you know, what are the really practical level bits of guidance? And we just talked more generally about the difficulty to plan when there's still a level of uncertainty. So you have the route map, we have the phases. However, we're not, you know, you can see it with phase two, we've not gone fully into phase two on day one. And also, you know, potentially we'll have to dial back should there be a second wave, even on a local level. And so basically what that translated into is I need to be very flexible. And that was also quite scary and quite challenging <laughs> for a lot of trustees. Um, we also covered a bit about the going concern. And we also had um, someone from an accountancy firm in our group and that the ability to say you're going concern and to prove it is actually very, very challenging for some charitable organisations. Um, and when we... Um, stronger position so in the um, sort of technical platforms as an example um, in a rural area where people have now got tablets and they've got access delivered as a result of the lockdown but how could we use that to engage better going forward even when we're not in a lockdown period um, and also the focus on mental well-being and mental health and maybe that's something people will adapt into their day-to-day -day practice even when lockdown and so yeah I think that was a very quick uh, <laughs> summary of what we discussed. Thank you very much Shona that's great. Um, Neil have you got anything that's different that you want to add into the conversation? Uh, yep hi Paula. Um, we had some similar things but uh, sort of embracing 
Zoom um, without getting Zoom fatigue. Uh, this is a good opportunity for you, for charities, to review their constitution, to have a look at their electronic voting provisions and a general review of their constitutions. Uh, we thought this may, this COVID situation may affect larger charities more than smaller charities going forward because of the fixed cost of larger charities, employee costs, buildings and equipment. And the difference between the sector in England and Scotland, there have been larger charities in England, and that smaller charities might be more agile and can maybe adapt more easily and quickly to the changing environment. People are also very complimentary of the... The format of this meeting, the, the regulator event, um, and I said uh, in the past, it's, uh, although Oscar's tried to get more rural events and cover the islands, it can be difficult because of logistics and, and costs, and obviously we can cover the whole of Scotland this, this way. Uh, they also liked the interactive uh, group chat function, uh, and possibly something to think going forward is Oscar could add this to our website. Okay, super. Thank you, Neil. Um, Craig, you're last on my list bar. Lindsay, have you got anything else that hasn't been covered already, please? Uh, not really too much. Most of it was about, um, you know, AGMs, how, how that was affecting it. I think one issue that people are experiencing and in particular is they have the technology, as in they have the laptops, they have the they have the screens, they have what they can use. The problem is, is the connections. It's, it's the actual infrastructure in the country that's the issue and how people use it. And they were wondering, you know, has Oscar, Oscar got any ability to help with that? You know, possibly lobbying the government about, you know, getting Wi-Fi provision increased. And, and how, how does the charitable sector, you know, use that in, to go forward with? I mean, how, how, how do... Oscar, how can Oscar communicate to the charitable sector about how to use things like Zoom, how to do this, and should we be putting them more information about that out? Okay, super, Craig. That's certainly something to consider. Um, last but not least, um, our chairperson, Lindsay. Thanks, Paula. Um, I won't repeat stuff that's already been covered, but uh, on the Zoom point and the technology point, Stuart's made it very, very well. I should probably admit to the fact I chair the Central Government Digital Transformation Board and I was going on at some length at a most recent meeting saying we need to sort out what we are doing in central government and what local authorities are doing in terms of Zoom or whatever particular um, mechanisms they want to use. The point you make, I've just heard about um, connectivity, although that's not directly the, that, my board's job, I will raise that because it does affect how, how a lot of us work. A couple of other things. Um, one of the people in our group is a lawyer who deals with a lot of trusts. And the trusts are finding with what's happened with the stock market, they are looking hard as to what sort of money they're going to have available. And many of them are worried they'll have a lot less. So that's something we really all need to think about if that's where we get money from. And many of them have closed their doors just now because they've, they've done what they can do. Um, there was another funding issue, and that was um, for organisations that are very connected with COVID and the activities around that, a lot of the money is available for whether it's heritage, lottery or others. For those organisations, say, in environment and others which are not so connected, there's a lack of clarity as to what's going to happen for funding for them. And that's maybe one of the messages we need to take back to Scottish government, because it's not just the third sector bit of Scot Scottish government that matters. It's much more broad. All parts of the directorates in Scottish government have some relationship with charities, and we need to get them to try and be clear as to what they will be doing on funding. Um, AGMs came up. There was one rather nice approach, uh, at, at, at the environmental charity in the south of Glasgow, they would prefer not to do uh, a digital one because they want to be able to connect. So they're looking at doing an outdoor AGM, which is a cracking idea, but they are in Glasgow and there is a lot of rain. I once lived there and then went back to Edinburgh. So there may be a run in brawlies, but what a lovely idea. To, I think it's a nice way to do it if you're much more a local community one. So, those were the key things that came out of ours that were different to others. 
I just want to say thank you so much for everyone joining us today. It's been a really interesting way of doing Mitra Leg Regulator. We've done some other um, events using this technology, but this has been far the biggest one, and I think it's super. I'd also like to say thanks to everyone from Oscar who's involved, staff and board colleagues, because that's made this work, I think, extremely well. Paula mentioned about the survey, which may be out or just about to, but please give us that back because it does help us make sure we can get these the best way we can to meet your needs for the future. And if there are questions that we haven't been able to answer or cover today, please use that. Otherwise, thank you so much. Good to see everyone. Bye just now. Thank you, everybody. Um... And further to what Lindsay said, I will also send out the, the PowerPoints and some of the chat to you guys has, has been requested um, a little bit later on this afternoon. Um, thanks very much for coming. See you again, hopefully. Thank you.